Well, we're glad you're here tonight, and uh, this is going to be an exciting night for us. And uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is the way that uh, we have this neat opportunity. One of the things we talk about is how generational we are as a church and how, how we're able to invest in the other generations, but then also this idea of discipleship and passing on. One of the really cool things in the, in the youth ministry here is to be able to have Brian and Garth and um, Tess and Kelly and Dave and Luke and uh, each one of these people have passed into the others and so in, in a big way, Brian, um, what's happening in the youth ministry today right now has your fingerprint on it. So that's really cool as we uh, take a look at that. And so we have absolutely no idea what's gonna happen tonight. And I don't know about you, but I find that like youth work. And uh, you know, because Karen and I actually helped out with a youth group here like a long time ago. I'm not gonna say when. And so, um, yeah. So Dave is gonna lead us in some songs tonight, and then after that, we'll go ahead and get started with whatever the program ends up being. So we're going to just sing the songs we know. They're pretty familiar. We're not going back to like the 50s youth group songs like Kumbaya. And, you, know, you want to go there? So sing along, kind of campfire style youth group.
So I'm going to invite our, our panel to come on up and we'll have them introduce themselves and, um, and be able to see who they are. All right. This is a little picture into what youth ministry is like. <laughs> Musical chairs. Huh. Check. Yeah, we make the games so we don't have to play them. Tess is yeah. older than me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. By right. how many months? Tess is older than me. I think right. I'm going to pray. Who looks older, though? Let's vote. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think I'm going to pray. <laughs> so, Lord, thanks. I thank you for each of these and uh, for the impact they've had for your kingdom. Lord, I, I count it a, a privilege to know each of them and to have ministered alongside of them. And I praise you, God, for what you've done through them and what you continue to do through them. And as we celebrate, Lord, each one of their impact in uh, Calvary's history, Lord, I pray that tonight would be a blessing for you as well. And uh, I pray that, uh, yeah, Lord, as we gather and think about this, we, we get a glimpse into what it means to invest into your kingdom. So I thank you for them, Lord, and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think I'll start by, if you were in, in the youth group as a volunteer under one of these, would you, would you stand up for a minute? All right. <laughs> And now if you were in one of their youth groups and lived to tell about it, <laughs> would you stand? Oh, oh yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start down here. Brian, it's so good to see you. When was the last time we saw each other? It, it has been a while. And now you're, you're here with, with the most experience, but you came after Garth. That means he's oldest. Um, no. No, Garth goes with here first, so he's the oldest. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to help you make clear. But, um, so how many years were you here? We were here for about seven years. Seven uh, Garth years. reminded me 1998. I couldn't uh, remember when we started. 1998 is about 2005. Okay, that's great. And when, you, when we say we, who, who are you including in that we? Joyce. My Amen. wife. And as Garth reminded me, she didn't volunteer. She had to do, no. She, she wasn't a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, she was involved quite a bit. Yeah, she was. So, um, yeah, anything else you want to tell us about yourself before we move down the line? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, no, we were here uh, 2000, uh, like 98 to 2005. Uh, we've been in the Free Church for a bunch of years. Uh, we're now serving in Alexander, Minnesota still in youth ministry, uh, in the Covenant Church. So first time in Minnesota, first time in the Covenant Church. We've been there about nine years now. And so you're still in youth ministry. Still in youth ministry. So you're one of those guys. Yeah. You're one of those yeah. lifers. Yeah, it's getting, going on 45 years now, full wow. time. Wow, amen. All right. All right. Yeah. Before Garth starts talking, is there anything you'd like to tell us about Garth? <laughs> too many stories, too little time. <laughs> We had some good times together. You did, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, oh, I'll speak loud enough. Is it going to work? Hey, thanks. Uh, so I got here, I don't know. Uh, I, I started as custodian with Merle in 96. And then Rachel and I were planning on going to the mission field to be dorm parents. And uh, Faith was here. Uh, and I started making friends with all the kids at Faith. And they didn't have a youth pastor. And Perry approached me and said, hey, you want to run a youth program? I'm like, sure. So I started that in 97, the summer of 97. And the end of the summer, Perry said, hey, we like what we see. We want to send you to school. Pick a school. I was like, oh, cool. And so I started going to Moody. And, uh, and what's the matter? Oh, yeah. yeah. I went to Moody. We're a lot of Moody people up here. All of us. 
Yes. All of us. We're all moody students. We're all moody. Yep, we're People. all moody. And then uh, Brian came on in 98, uh, and then we were here, and I, when I left in 2007 for the mission field, so 10 years. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And you're still kind of in youth work. You drive a bus, right? I do not drive a bus. Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> I did. I did last year. Yeah. I'm in youth ministry. I have youth of my own. There we go. <laughs> Amen. Well, cool. Anything you want to tell us about Tess before? About Tess. Well, where should we start? Tess was scared to talk to me when she first kind of met me. She was attending Moody when I was going down there, and she wanted a ride home. But she didn't want to ask me, so she asked Trish to ask me. And Trish was like, I'll ask him. <laughs> ah, the roles have changed now. Trish. Yeah, and then uh, that kind of started up our relationship. Yep. You were we always in the time. front row. Weird. Nice. I, was, I was the old guy in the front yeah, row. Who's were. that old guy in the front row? You wore your row? backpack really high. Yeah, yeah I, I was. Know, I <laughs> <laughs> you're scary, and you're really tall. <laughs> but I was younger than you are now. I still feel like young, right? <laughs> you are young. Yeah, um, yeah and then <clears throat> Garth said I was going to serve uh, when I got out of Moody. <laughs> so I did. And uh, he's like, well, you can pick junior high or senior high. And I just thought, well, Wednesdays during the week I should do junior high because Sundays I might want to do something in like my own time. <laughs> but that was totally the Lord because I ended up loving junior high anyway. And so then... Uh, yeah, I loved it. I got in, and then when you left, you said, you're going to lead now. <laughs> Just kidding. You didn't say that in those many words, but you did encourage me to step out of my box, and it was great. So then I got on in 07, and then welcomed this guy on in 07, too. And then, what are we doing? <laughs> Sorry. So now I have kids and I don't have brains or something like that. I don't know. I can't stay focused. So now I've met Brian and we have three, four kids, three, three babies with us right now. And McKenna's here too. And um, yeah, that was kind of crazy because when I was looking through old pictures, we were at the same districts in 2001. As students? No, no as you leaders. Were leader. Oh, both leaders. That's right. Yeah. It's crazy. Just where he was at in life versus where I was at in life. And then how the Lord kind of brought us together eventually, and it's kind of a cool story. So, yeah, that was really crazy. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about Dave before we pass the mic to him? Well, we've mended things now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I did, um, no, I, I think we had a lot of fun right away. It was good. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it went okay, well, I want to be nice. We have people I wish here. we were switched seats right now. <laughs> okay, I did have to kind of help him be a little relational with the kids and force them on you. <laughs> no, I was just so introducey. 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 Yep. <laughs> yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> Dave, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Chuck's like, Dave, go. <laughs> Quick. So we came um, in 2007. I graduated high school in 97. Garth, so just to <laughs> set it for you. So what? So you were starting ministry, and I was still in high school. So 2007 to 2014 was our time here, my wife April, and we only had one child when we came, and then we had three more, almost said four more, three more, and but we have five kids now, and uh, yeah, we're in Senegal, West Africa, serving with Avant Missions, Ministries. I'm doing overseas missions there. So we left right from here, and that's kind of the last thing we did. So this has been our home church and supporting church. And I'm trying to think what else has our time. Going to test, did senior high. She did junior high. And we went through a lot of great staff meetings together, a lot of good memories. And, a lot uh, of videos. What? A lot of videos. Yeah, we together. made a lot of videos. Yes. We sold a lot of T-shirts. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We tried to sell a lot of t-shirts, but no one bought them. Um, Don't we have some to throw out right we, now? Do we have? Oh, yes. yeah, get, it, get going. I'm keeping it. See? I'm going to keep it because that's a classic. 
<laughs> just kidding. Look at t-shirts, one each person t-shirts in your open family, the door. Gabe. We need we need that video to play. <laughs> Let t-shirts, t-shirts open, open the door. The door. <laughs> yep. So, anything to say about Luke? Sure. You prime me for that one. Luke um, was one of my students um, in youth ministry in Minnesota before, and then came from Moody. And probably our greatest, one of our greatest memories was. Um, the fact that he would live in the basement of our duplex on the weekends. So while being a Moody student, he would drive up on the weekends to help me do youth ministry. And he lived in the basement, which was a very, yeah, great experience. He had some <laughs> great memories in our basement. There was, there was one night when you and April were fast asleep upstairs. And I <laughs> kid you not, I searched for a cricket for about three hours because <laughs> I couldn't sleep. But yeah, I... Uh, I'm, I'm a blip on the radar of youth ministry here <laughs> at Calvary, uh, but I'm really grateful to be up here today. So yeah, Dave was my mentor, and I was majoring in youth ministry at Moody at the time, and he had accepted this position, and I said, well, great, I'll help you out. And so I would drive out every weekend and serve on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and then drive back to Moody on Sunday evenings. and. And doing that quickly turned into an internship here at Calvary. Uh, I was here from 2007 to 2010. And uh, when I graduated, I started working at uh, First Free Rockford in, in Rockford, Illinois, where I'm now the lead pastor there. And so I met my wife on a youth ministry retreat here, yeah. Jesse, Jessica Jensen. Yeah. And so... Yeah, she uh, thought that I was loud and annoying at first, and at that time it was cool, believe it or not, to have a soul patch, and so she, uh, she, that drove her nuts, and so um, anyways, yeah, we have one daughter, six-year-old girl named Amelia. Well, do you have anything that you remember about I do. Kelly? Kelly was a senior when I came, and uh, I, I remember not so much Kelly being a student, but uh, Kelly and I had the privilege of partnering together on a couple different opportunities through First Free and Calvary here when uh, Kelly was working at that time primarily with the middle schoolers. And so uh, I've been able to kind of work next to Kelly uh, on a handful of occasions, and it's been a, a great joy to be able to do ministry and partner with him in the gospel in that way. Yeah. So I'm Kelly. <laughs> Garth was my middle school youth pastor, and then Dave was my high school youth pastor, and then Tess is the one that got me in uh, youth ministry. Because I just want to say the first night Kelly helped out, I will never forget, but <laughs> I had some pretty crazy boys at that time. He was like, I'm sorry, I can't help out anymore. They just don't respect me. And I was like, no, you're perfect. You need to stay. And he did, and look at you now, Kelly. I'm so yes. proud of you. I really am. Yeah, and I haven't left since. <laughs> Yeah, so I came on as a one-year intern when Tess was on the world race. So she was out traveling the world, and I was still in school and then doing the junior high from school and driving back every night, oh, every Wednesday night for that. And then I've been full-time since 2013-ish, yeah, and currently over both junior high and senior high. So you actually grew up right through the ministry. Yep. And... and you, you also met a woman. I did. Yes. My wife, Allie, is over there. <laughs> she was a youth ministry intern at Elmbrook Church when I was doing a youth, when I was through my internship here. So we were both interning at the same time. Cool. So that was really cool. Okay. <laughs> and we have kids. <laughs> we have a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old and then a baby on the way in December. Cool. Well, that's great. Thanks for that. You. Kelly, you had something you were going to ask. I do. As a current youth pastor here at Calvary, I thought, well, we were trying to do an icebreaker downstairs when we were meeting before this, and everyone just kept talking. <laughs> so um, we're going to do it now. <laughs> so this is the classic two truths and a lie that you guys have probably done if you grew up in youth ministry. So you have to come up with two truths and a lie, but this is ministry edition. So two truths and a lie, youth ministry edition, and we're going to pull the audience and get you guys involved to guess which one is a truth 
or a lie just by holding up your hands and maybe you'll get a free t-shirt or something like that, I don't know. So maybe we should start over there and you can do Two Truths and a Lie, Youth Ministry Edition, and then we'll poll the audience to see if they uh, can sniff out your lies. Okay, Two Truths and a Lie. Um, we lost a student on a missions trip on Ellis Island. That's one number one. Second one is that um, I drove a church bus with no brakes on a rafting retreat. And number three is um, I'm, I was in one of our churches, the oldest pastor on staff, uh, including our senior pastor. All right, so everyone holds up either one, two, or three, and you're trying to guess the lie. So one, two, or three, and you're trying to guess the lie. Joyce, will you please vote? <laughs> <laughs> so um, number one was we lost a student at Ellis Island. That was actually from this church. We lost him for several hours. We went, remember East Coast ministry trip? The yep. Bob. Yeah, with Tom. <laughs> yep. Um, Who was it? We I wasn't actually, there. Somebody, <laughs> they thought we were going to the shuttle to, to go to the next place, and they saw, thought we were on there, so they jumped onto the shuttle boat, and uh, we couldn't find them, and Ellis Island, and um, what was the other? Yeah, Statue of Liberty. They, they don't communicate with each other, so um, yeah, it took us a couple hours to find them. Um, <laughs> second one, driving a bus with no brakes. That did actually happen on a canoe trip, a uh, rafting trip, um, our Brakes went out, and I called our leadership, and they said, well, just drive it. It'll be fine. You'll get home. So, yeah, like 60 miles later, using the parking brake and downshifting a lot and rolling through stop signs on the highway, we did it. Um, the lie was actually um, oldest person on staff, including our senior pastor. That's the lie because it's not one church but two churches. So. <laughs> and, and in our current church, um, our senior pastor had to ask me, his youth pastor, about Social Security before he retired. <laughs> nice, yeah, I'm headed for that. Okay, um, let's see. Um, okay, Luke's wife went on our first mission trip. Um, I once did a challenge of bungee jumping to raise money for a missions trip. And early on, the students wanted to name the youth ministry Young Wife because I was married to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so everyone hold up your votes. What do you think? Okay. The lie is the bungee jumping. I've uh, never done that. I'd like to. <laughs> Anybody do bungee jumping? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> yes, Jesse was on our very first missions trip when Wyatt, you guys know Wyatt, the one that smashed his face? Yeah. Uh, he was six weeks old, and we took uh, 10 students and a baby, and oh my goodness, the baby and his stuff took up more space than the 10 students. Yeah. But, you know, I rented a van. I rented a van, and they said, uh, I said, can I pull a trailer? Oh, sure, you can pull a trailer. I went to pick it up, and I said, where's the hitch? Hitch for what? I said, I need to pull a trailer. And they said, you can't pull a trailer. I'm like, oh. That was the night before we were leaving, and we had all this stuff. Merle built me a car top carrier for the, the van, and we put these duffel bags up there. Remember, Jesse? Like 12 <laughs> duffel bags up on there every, every time. Anyway, okay, so Jesse went on the trip. And yes, the students wanted to name our youth group Young Wife after Young Life. They said, yeah, let's call it Young Wife. So, well, in a few years, it's not going to work. So, <laughs> <I'll be> <laughs> right, oh. like, like 20 years from now. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. <laughs> I love you, Rachel. <laughs> um, okay. I will try to do these so you, it's not obvious what the lie is. Um, I don't have a poker face in them. Um, okay, let's see. I once got 25 kids in a 12-passenger van and drove with them. Uh, I once drove to the wrong camp 
for our retreat. And I want Are all these true? They're, dri- they're all driving. <laughs> they're all driving and they're all true right now. She couldn't come up with a lie. What's your third lie? The other one was going to be I got pulled over by a cop, oh, but that's not a lie, so I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. Wait, wait, wait. I, wait I, no, I got, I got, no, I got another one. I got, I got a better one. I picked up a hitchhiker with kids line. in the van. <laughs> so these are my never ever do again. Okay, what's our vote? <laughs> you forgot to I lie. Did lie. There's a lie in there. Are you sure there's a lie in there? This blonde is just highlights. Come on. All right. All right. Uh, what do you got, guys? All right, number two, I did not drive to the wrong camp. Yeah, you would. Yeah, you did. Yes, you did. You just didn't know it. I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? Not when I had Kelly as my co-pilot. He kept me on. (laughs) We need to get a a mic for Dawn. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we do need a mic for you, Dawn. I'm glad your kids survived. of your kids. But yes, we did. I, I was, it was after I got back from the race, so I was very much like, you know, the Lord is going to bless us no matter what and keep us safe. And so there was a guy hitchhiking in the middle of a snowstorm. And I'm like, yes, come on in. Uh, and then... Um, I did not teach her that. Okay, Chuck? <laughs> I did not. Okay, but it... And then and I had to call all the parents and apologize. But we did make it safely, and we did bless the man with the ride. And huh. um, Was that once or twice? <laughs> Twice. <laughs> I'm nice, and you never know. It could be an angel. It could be an angel. You got to obey these things. No, They're we did share the gospel nudgings. with the second one. Okay, we... <laughs> Darn it, Kelly, you know too much about me. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, 25 kids. They're small. They all fit in, and we had to get from one point to another. That was at district, so... Technically, what happens at districts stays at districts, right? Uh, not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, the Lord was on my side. So. <laughs> Chuck okay, it up to Dave, that. go ahead, Dave. <laughs> All right. As a lead pastor right now, I'm starting to have convulsions at some of these. <laughs> know, like, right? yeah. I'm going to go back and meet with our youth staff and be like, <laughs> make sure the parents are reading the fine print in those waivers. <laughs> All right. My first one is that Anchorman was the worst movie I ever showed to the whole youth group. Um, My second one is that I did a missions trip with Butch Iker alone as the only chaperones. And my third one is that the Delavan Township Police were called by me and showed up to almost arrest me. All right, so everyone votes. What do you have? Nobody's believing. All right, it's the first one. Yeah. You showed a worse movie, didn't you? I did. (laughs) Worst movie I ever showed was uh, Spaceballs. So that's probably way worse. Some of your kids. I was in Minnesota. Luke was with me. Luke said, this is a good movie. (laughs) So I banked on my youth leaders, you know. As a lead Um, pastor right now. Yeah. (laughs) The second one, uh, Butch Iker, yes, we went to Bemidji um, up in Minnesota together. We were the only two with a bunch of girls as well. Thankfully, his daughter was in there, but we had no female chaperone. And that kind of was a crazy adventure together where he ended up in the hospital. And, yeah, great story. And the third one Wait, wait, wait. You did what in the hospital? He just, like, got stomach poison and ended up going. I had to take him to the hospital. It was, yeah, crazy. Crazy story where Butch was just being Butch. And I called Sally, and Sally's like, just leave him. He's fine. (laughs) So I was like, Sally, I think you might need to come up here. No, 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 it's Butch. And he was crawling across the the floor to try to get in. He's like, I'm dying. The nurse is like, I'm like, Butch, are you all right? And sure enough, they took him as fast as they could. So it was food poisoning from Perkins. That was it. So he will never, I don't know if he probably still eats a Perkins. I have no idea. It's closed. And it's closed. Okay, for that reason. And the third one, uh, students were TPing my house, and I decided to call the Delavan Township Police. Thankfully, it was not Radloff, but it was another police officer who came. And at that same time, I decided to hang out there with a paintball gun just in case the students came back. And so as I came out with the paintball gun, the this, this police officer was like, 
whoa, what's going on? I had to explain the whole story, so it almost royally backfired. But Ooh. And to add on that one, so he, it was cl you. he cleaned up the toilet paper that no. we toilet papered on their house. No, my oh. wife did. Oh, she was April pregnant. did. <laughs> April pregnant. was pregnant and I'm so sorry. mad the next day cleaning up all this wet toilet paper that was hanging all over our yard. Well, we went back the same night and we did it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They're like, they cleaned it up already? <laughs> Terrible. Wait, can can Dave do two more? No, two more. No, Dave, no, no, two no. more. Come on. Yeah, again. Too too good. You're up. All right. That's, that's true. <laughs> that's false. False information. He brought that with him from St. Cloud. <laughs> from Moody. From Moody. Yeah, that came from, from Moody. Chicago to St. Cloud yep. to Delavinner, Williams Bay. Oh. So. Um, Number one, I had the church chairman's kid arrested at the Mexico border. <laughs> Not this church. <laughs> Number two, Dave and I almost blew up a youth room. Do you remember that? I just gave that away. And number three, number three is um, I once... Um, <laughs> I, I need to pick a different one. My filter is kicking in. Um, <laughs> it was a true story. But um, third and finally, uh, we'll say um, we once met a U.S. Olympic uh, medalist as part of youth group. All right. <laughs> Have your votes. All right, it was number one. That's the line. Oh. So we did get pulled over at the Mexican border um, because, well, no, one of the students forgot their passport at home. No matter how many times we told them, you don't really need it going out when you're crossing. They aren't concerned about that. But apparently, the U.S. government, that's important when you come back in. So, um, so he did. We did get stopped for that, but it was not the church chairman's kid. But um, the second one, Dave and I, this was back in St. Cloud. We were doing some renovations because we were licensed contractors or so we thought um, <laughs> with the youth room. And we heard something coming out on the other side of the wall. And we weren't sure if it was gas or if it was water. So our instinct kicked in. And the very first thing we did was both dive under the pool table, um, thinking somehow that wouldn't crush us when it blew up. And so uh, anyways, we flooded the kitchen next door instead of a gas leak. And then uh, finally, we did uh, in St. Cloud. Uh, we were playing a scavenger hunt. And John Harrington, who was part of the 1980 US Olympic team, was my hockey coach growing up. Um, and so he, uh, we were able to meet him. So, yeah. I care about my job more than it seems like you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I read the wrong verse in the Bible. Number one, one I love my senior pastor. <laughs> Number two, I love our church chairman. Yeah. Number three. <laughs> Oh, snap. I have my All kids right. sit alphabetically during youth group. <laughs> so, uh, like one of my older brothers before me, I almost got kicked out of a youth retreat when I was a teen. Um, the cops got called on my house for a Bible study one time. And I once painted the carpet in the youth room white. Chuck? Which one's a lie? <laughs> I didn't see a lie in there. <laughs> <laughs> he knows about them all. So what do you guys think? One, two, or three? It is, it is one. I never got kicked out. Kelly or was, was close nice. to being clicked. Kelly was nice. I was a goody two-shoe, slash still am, so. But the other two? Oh, the other two? OK, well, uh, when we lived in Williams Bay, we were having a Bible study, and we just had a lot of kids in our apartment. And so some neighbors called the cops on us because they were questionable teenagers in the property. Uh, but nope, that was just our Bible study. And then we were painting the youth group room and I had some teens help me out. And that was a mistake because there's white paint all over the floor. So that's why the backstage is pushed in the back of the youth room instead of the front to cover up all the paint. Oh, that's why. And I just uh, called it stadium seating because the teens like it. 
Well, I taught Kelly my mojo. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that's really cool about having all of you up on the platform here is, you know, collectively, there's decades of experience here. But also, you know, most of you have been in ministry like, you know, 15, 20 years, right? I mean, you know, Kelly, I know you're probably on the short end of that, but, you know, if you count your time as a youth leader, too. And uh, youth ministry is changing quite a bit, isn't it? So um, what have you noticed to be some of the biggest changes from when you first stepped into youth ministry into what you see happening with youth today? And I know some of you aren't necessarily involved in youth ministry right now, but you're still, I'm sure, have some, some contact there. So what are some of the, what do you see as, as being some of the bigger challenges right now? And what are some of the things that maybe are easier now than they were before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there is no such thing as a church bus anymore. So yeah, that's, there's that too. But really, yeah. <laughs> you want to show them a picture? I, I, I like the story of the call I got from. Hey, Chuck, did you know that the 15 passenger vans won't fit in the parking garages? Hey. <laughs> Hey, it, it fit. It fit, yeah, it did. <laughs> it was just tight, okay? It's, you, you know, you go in and there's a bar. Mm -hmm. The bar didn't move. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yes, I scratched the van. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things um, that has made it easier in one sense is communication. And I think the cell phones is one of those things, but also just all the different ways we can communicate now. That's also a drawback um, with all the devices everybody has, but it's also, I mean, that is a, a changing world thing that we have to deal with in youth ministry as well as anywhere else is how do you communicate, how do you keep people's attention, but also then it's all the screen. And right now with this last year with COVID, it's a screen. They're just tired of screens. And so how do you engage um, in a different kind of way? So that's a, a big change. I would say kind of being removed for, for, for a while now, but thinking about it and saying, um, if I think about the games we did, <laughs> like when I think of cool games we did that were so simple, I'm like, we'd be fired. Like it'd be, you know, there'd be lawsuits on the church. I can think of stuff we did that were edgy back then. At the same time, I'm sure the further back it goes, you know, like, Hooking up a battery, car battery, to a chair yeah. to shock a kid? Yeah. That's not good? Okay. Using a cattle prod to shock someone, too? Charlie that would Bunny. be... So Paintballs? Paintballs, that yeah. kind of stuff. So, yeah, I just... I don't know. I think that would be very difficult thinking about Kelly and these guys that are still in it to say, how do you stay safe while also still having fun with a generation that, you know, it could turn just like that. It's kind of scary. Or even having kids on your shoulders, because you would have kids on your shoulders sometimes. Or even being oh, yeah. able to, yeah, touch kids, even if it's nice to you or whatever. It's yeah. still, I wouldn't do that these days. <laughs> well, I think, too, every context is different, but the context I've been in, um, I see kids that are not, not as much of a risk taker in some of those things. Um, so some of the games, it's like, oh, I don't want to play that because I don't know if I can do that or look stupid in front of doing it, if I'm doing it. I don't want to look stupid in front of people. And early on, um, it was like a game, yeah, I'll, I'll be stupid in front of people, no big deal. But now it's a lot more self-conscious, a lot more anxiety about those kinds of things. So for us, our game play has changed totally. It's not as um, upfront, you know, where somebody can be as stupid. Even... I mean, I've done water skiing forever, taught a lot of kids how to water ski, and a lot of kids are, have a hard time even thinking about trying that because, well, what if I fail in front of somebody else? Uh, they might, I might be able to teach them one-on-one -on -one or with a couple kids in a boat, but not in front of a youth group. They just don't want to be there to look like they're failing. So that's changed. Social media has done that because back in the day when we didn't have social media, if I mess up, it's just in front of 10 people. If I mess up now, it's in front of everybody. It's plastered everywhere. And everybody's going to make fun of me. 
Yeah, before the bullying used to only happen at schools, right? But now people can bully over the internet and poke fun of people over the internet. So bullying and tearing people down is now where our teens are experiencing that is not only just at school, but it follows them home, follows them to church and stuff like that. So that's one thing. And then I also thinking um, kids, are, kids can entertain themselves at their home, in their bedroom, on their phone. So the, the fun events that we used to do, and like, oh my gosh, but we have nothing going on. So yeah, we always just would come to youth group. But now kids can entertain themselves in their bedroom, and they're pretty content doing that. So it's, real, it's like pulling teeth to try to get kids involved. Uh, no longer the fun events draws them in as much as it did back then. Yeah, I, I would say two things. The first thing, piggybacking off what Kelly was saying, is content, right? You can you can get content wherever you want it. You're, I mean, in your phone, it's literally millions upon millions of websites at the click of a screen. So content is no longer key, right? And so that's where community is is so important. And for those that serve in youth ministry, you cannot replace relationship through glass as well as you can shoulder to shoulder. And so it's so crucially important that our students have the opportunity to get in contact with a mentor on a regular basis. And, and that can be through a touch point through text message or you know FaceTime, whatever it is. But, but the point is, is that content is no longer that crucial. But then on the flip side, the second thing I would say is identity. One of the things that, especially nowadays, that you're seeing in our culture today is that we are at an identity crisis for youth. And, and that crisis is happening because so many different voices, because of those, those phones that are in our pockets, are at our fingertips at all times, telling me who I ought to be, what I am becoming, what's going to get celebrated, and what's going to get punished or bullied. And so if we're not willing to talk about identity in Jesus Christ first and foremost with students, especially starting with the parents in the home, um, then it's going to be an uphill battle the entire way. And so as youth workers, you know, identity in Jesus Christ is one of the most important topics right now because identity, you look at politics, you look at uh, sexual identity, LGBTQ+, you look at identity and who you're, not just who you're voting for, but what way your family would lean, things like that. I mean, identity is key. Silver Birch Ranch, we've learned about how the kids were trying to adapt through COVID, adapt through non-attendance, adapt through school over the computer. And they were planning to have, they couldn't have it, but they were planning to have a bunch of kids come up. They were really troubled with their youth leaders, with their parents, and try and figure out life what it was for them now. So how do you address that now as you're going ahead with your youth groups? Is that clear enough for you? If I'm understanding you right, the question is, with all this last year with pandemic and screens and all that kind of stuff, how does that translate now that we're back open and how do we connect with kids and those kinds of things? Is that Broad picture? Well done. Okay. Uh, one of the things I've seen... The depression. Okay. Um, generally, I guess for how, what, how, would I, how would I would answer that is that um, depression and anxiety are huge right now among students. Um, the mental health stuff is huge. I think pan the pandemic has exacerbated that. Um, 
kids need, I think community is a huge thing. Uh, kid needs, kids need people around them. Um, they're asking tough questions. They want to see people that, that don't necessarily have all of the answers to that, but will walk through it with them. Um, so I think, in my, my thinking, it's scripture's just still got to be the basis. It's, a, it's our solid foundation because the world's telling all kinds of different things that are going to heal you and make things right. Um, I think we need to be able to talk about uh, mental health kinds of things in the context of scripture and say that it's not an off-topic subject. Um, we're trying to make it so that in our area, in our youth group, that there's nothing that's off limit to talk about because so often in the church or in different contexts, kids are told you can't talk about that and you just ignore it and you can only ignore things so long before it becomes a, a bigger issue. Um, so it's walking alongside students together. I, I see this last year with the pandemic that um, kids with all the screen time are, are really wanting to have more community. Some don't know how to have that socially, um, even the social interaction anymore. They've lost touch of how to do that. Um, we typically don't do a lot of things in the summer in our area because it's a resort area kind of like here. So kids are really busy. This year with, um, with kids that aren't coming back to jobs right away and that kind of stuff, we're doing more things this summer just to get kids together, just to, just to touch each other and, and us having a touch with them. Um, but it's all in the context of scripture is the basis. Yes, Jesus has an answer to this and we can walk through with you, but, but we're not perfect. We, we're dealing with some of the stuff too, but this is how we're walking through it and we want to walk through that with you. Question for you guys. <clears throat> How important, and gal, you know, what, you have something to say? Oh, good. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, I was trying to get my thoughts together, but um, I'm not doing youth ministry at the moment yet, um, but with McKenna, she's 13, and just some of the things that I've observed, um, um, even with her friends and her classmates, um, she has one friend who just won't even come over for a sleepover. She's just really anxious about that, you know, and seeing how that's changed. And then also, um, there just seems to be more of a seriousness, you know, instead of um, being more lighthearted that they, that they had, like a, a lightheartedness, like, um, I don't know, like nothing's going to touch me. And we all had that, you know. But um, now it's just there's a lot of fear, you know, and a lot, a lot more just, I think maybe the seriousness is from the depression or whatever. You know, I agree with that there is a lot of depression from that. And so... Um, yeah, we're just trying to help her talk about things and get involved, stay involved in church and, and just, yeah, and pray for her, obviously. But those are definitely some things that I saw. I think another thing, I'm removed from youth ministry, but I've got my daughter and her friends and things, and my daughter rips on me for this, like, big time, but we call them asking power questions. So it's not a question with an answer of yes or no, but it's a question that makes the kid think and, like, goes deep that Google can't answer. So when you ask a question of a teenager and you say, hey, da-da-da-da, and they can whip out Google and go, oh, yeah, and give it right back to you or a fact or something like that, again, they're using social media. But when you can ask a deeper question about the student themselves and you can ask a question that is like what or how, you know, or describe, and you start with those kind of words, all of a sudden the student sits there and goes, I've, I've never thought about that or I've never been asked that. And all of a sudden you start showing that you care that student starts unpacking who they are, and next thing you know, you're like, look, they're starting to have breakthroughs without really wrestling with the depression. You know, I mean, it's, it's there at the same time. I think it's, as adults, again, we're quick to say, well, Google says, or we go to our phones quick for answers, but asking, again, Emma's looking at me like, seriously, but asking power questions. I do it to her friends. I ask a power question. Their friends are like, man, Mr. Cousins is deep, and I'm like, I'm not deep. I'm asking a basic question that is just big, and it can't be answered with a yes, no, or I don't care, or who cares, or Trump, or Biden. Like, there's none of that. It's got to go beyond that, and once that happens, all of a sudden, a student says, this person cares for me, and they're listening, and next thing you know, it's like there's a relationship that builds from that. So I think, I think going back to asking those good questions of a teenager is, like, huge. Do you have an example of a power question that you could maybe ask Emma? Well, I've got one that Claire gave me once. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. You know, what makes a man a man? <laughs> and I was like, good question, Claire. Uh, well, as long as you didn't mom. tell her to Google it. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Uh, for example, I like out with Emma. Des describe your perfect day with your sister Claire. And she goes, "What?" And I don't give any clue to that. Describe your perfect day with your sister Claire, her youngest. Well, not now, second youngest sister. And just let her go with that. And then it's does, does she know Claire? Can she figure things out? Is she thinking about it and going? I never thought about that. And it kind of just brings out a whole other conversation that you're like, you know. So it. Yeah, I think it's just asking better questions. And being okay with silence. Mm -hmm. That's something that not a lot of people are okay with when it comes to students, is that they're hearing you. They may not respond right away. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times they're thinking about what you're saying, and even though they may not come out and actually say it, you're, you're making them think, and you're making them ponder, consider, pray, um, all of those things. And a lot of times, I know with my experience, and Kelly, I'm sure nowadays the same as with you, when you're sitting in a circle of students having life group discussion, you need to be okay with awkward silence. And you cannot step in and fill that silence with an answer for them. They, they need to figure that out and wrestle through that on their own. Or even be spoon-fed the, the answer to those questions. You let them struggle it with it together as a group and come up with the answers themselves. And oftentimes they'll tell you things that make you think and teach you, right? I've learned so many things from kids in youth group. When you ask them a question and they give you an answer, you're like, wow, I never thought about that, you know? Kids are awesome. So one of the things we see on the platform here is multi-generational, you know, that lots of generations here. And, and in the church, we strive for that, to have as many generations as possible. But how important is it for the generations who are not students to be impacting students' lives? It's huge. Um, when we came to the church that we're at now, um, I was just below 60. And when they asked me to come, I said, do you know how old I am? <laughs> and part of the thing they said is, yes, we're looking for, there have been a history of short-term youth pastors that are looking for somebody to come in and stabilize some things. So that was kind of their background. But, but we walked in and we inherited youth leaders that had been in youth ministry volunteering for several years. And most of them were middle-aged on up. And most of our youth leaders right now, because we don't have, we have a technical college in town, we don't have a uh, college area. So most of our leaders are middle age on up. And we've had some younger ones from time to time. But our kids have connected with those leaders. And um, I will tell them, I'll do the heavy lifting in the teaching part, and then we go to small groups. You guys are doing the heavy, heavy lifting on the relational part. And it really is, you see those students with their leaders, and they, they have this connection because they know that these leaders care for them. Um, some of those are old enough to be their, definitely their parents, if not their grandparents, but there's a way that they can talk with them that's different than when I was first in youth ministry in my early 20s. Um, so there's a different connection. We just did a, um, a youth ministry trip, it was what it was supposed to be, a missions trip to Alaska. It got canceled last year. Um, and our adults had planned to go to Alaska last year too, and that got canceled because of COVID, so we combined it, and so it became an intergenerational high school on up. Um, and we have been asked now several times, mostly from our adults, our students too, mostly from our adults. We had some that were up in their upper 80s all the way down. When can we do that again? Because they love connecting with the students, they love seeing those students involved, and not only how hard they work, but laughing with them. Now there's a connection when they see them at church that's totally different than there is from just knowing that that person attended church with them. I think one of our uh, most amazing youth volunteers was Audrey Yakes. And uh, I remember her, she, she did the children's, the nursery for so many years. And I remember her telling me one time, was, she said that, uh, there was nobody to lead the children's ministry or the nursery, and the pastor mentioned it from the pulpit, and she goes, I can do that. <laughs> she went and did it for 15 years. And then I, I approached her and said, hey, she was done with that. And I said, 
you want to come work with junior hires? I could do that. And how long did she do it? She did it for a long time. And boy, did she pour into those kids until she passed. Yeah. Us, you know? oh. She ended up writing notes to all the kids in her kind of her final months that she was going through chemo and stuff. She wrote letters to the kids and said that they were praying for them. And um, she knitted a blanket for my kid that wasn't even born yet. That was that was how intentional and sweet that she was. And she also would get on the dodgeball court with her walker, <laughs> and the kids would throw dodgeballs at her, and she still and she still would not get off the court. <laughs> See, Garth, you can do that. <laughs> I, did, I did tell Garth, he was giving me a hard time how old I was when I was here. And I said that at least when my kids graduate from high school, I'll be able to stand in the stands and be able to get up and say hi and, and cheer them on. And, and when your last kid graduates, you're going to have to be in a walker at the bottom of the thing going, It's in good four job, years, good yeah. Job. <laughs> Well, that's going to be us for sure. Five months, six months. <laughs> but it is, um, there's some really fun research out there from different youth ministry organizations. Um, there's this one about called Sticky Faith. And one of the things that helps kids' faith stick is having connections with multiple adult adults during their time at church. And so the more connections that they have with older adults at church, the more likely their faith is um, going to stick after um, they graduate. So that just is kind of a statistic that just shows you like, wow, the importance of intergenerational discipleship and relationships in the church. I think some of our best days of youth ministry were when we were doing midpoint over a conference point and having multiple people, different people from the church, different stages of life, different walks of life, elders, and other people speaking into the teens, and the teens love that. And so, again, I just look back on my youth ministry experience and say that was probably the best window of really speaking into the lives of teens that we, that we had, and it was multi-generational. It was effective, easy. I think it also teaches the kids how to talk to older people, too. Um, and <clears throat> even just the respect that Audrey demanded and received as well, too. Um, and, and all of our leaders, obviously, that were working there. Um, just interacting with people, like even now, it's even harder for these kids to even carry a conversation with, with anybody. So just um, being able to talk with any generation is good. Yeah, it can be hard when we meet in the hallway to know how to speak to a student because we just, you know, we just don't know. So um, now we just ask them a power question and yeah, we're good to go, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the time we have left here, does anybody have a question for anybody on the panel here that you'd like to ask? say here you become a slave to this oh, <laughs> oh what, what do i do with this here i'll hold it you I just you just you just talk i'll hold it no okay, fighting go i got it go ahead <laughs> i got it okay okay thank you you're I, welcome uh, i usually uh, i have to listen to your wife i get proper instruction but <laughs> at any rate, we'll do it. anyway I, what, what i've said is this is uh, people have come to be a slave to this you know Young people now, uh, they want, want the right answer. Click, 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 and is it the right answer? I still love to open up my, my book. It's called the Bible, God's Word all the way through. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's quite a change from when I was young. I was uh, born and raised on a farm, and... And the phone I had was mounted on the wall, and you crank it, and it was an eight-party line. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you have ever heard about rubbering 
well, this is where you get all the latest gossip going on to the neighbors, you know? And you can't, can't find that kind of stuff out here. I mean, <laughs> yeah. But things have changed, and uh, you know, this is the computer, everything. You know, when you have a little two-year-old great-granddaughter sit by you and she's got her little uh, iPod or whatever to play with, I know you don't know how to do this, Grandpa, but I show you. You know, I mean, th this figure here, you know, they know how to punch all the buttons. So things have changed. And people, the young people, uh, really need the Lord in their life because, uh, you know, there's so many temptations out there now. And, and that's what you need to uh, avoid, well, getting into real bad trouble. And, uh, you know, I got in trouble when I was young, but uh, uh, I didn't get that kind of serious trouble like they do now. Yeah, maybe we'll leave that for another time, George. Okay, well, <laughs> guys, maybe you could talk a little yeah, bit I, about I, that. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm getting gonna down, to I'm getting okay, down, okay, okay, all right, I'm okay. getting about okay. the proper definition of trouble. Yes. You see, it all started one day when I gave their children my sympathy for having parents like they got. And then Karen over there, I was trouble. And she kept saying I was trouble. So finally, a few years ago, I says, I demand respect. Well, she's, what is it? It's Mr. Trouble. <laughs> and, and so we got an anniversary card here not too long ago. And, and I was opening it up in the family room. And Harriet was in the kitchen. And I opened it up, and I started to laugh. And we, she says, what you laughing about? I got a an anniversary card from Pastor Chuck and Perfect Karen. I said, man, she just left herself wide open here on that one. So, so I, I, I get back at her once in a while. <laughs> you know what? I think Kelly just got a new leader. Yeah. Amen. That's what I think. Sunday nights. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, we do have we'll a video later. to show, too. Okay. Is it ready to go? Okay, give me two minutes. Um, talk to us a little bit about what George just said that was really pretty, you know, pretty important. And that is, you know, that things are a lot different now. You talked about identity, Luke, which is so huge. And um, the stuff that our kids are learning in school, right, that students get taught. And uh, it's much different than it was 10 years ago, you know, even, uh, even five years ago. And so how, you know, as, as as our students are really looking for truth, how important is it, you know, um, as uh, George talked about opening the book that's the Bible, and how important it is that now compared to even 10 or 15 years ago? Well, you know, I, I was thinking about that, George. When you were a kid, I bet your grandfather would have said, you know, we didn't have these fancy things on the wall that you could call people on, you know? There's always been technology and there always will be technology. Yes, we're, it's glutting our culture now, but we've just got to learn how to manage it, right? And um, I, I just got to say this, no matter how uh, inundated we will be with technology, God's word will always endure, no matter what, Amen. no matter how much technology there is. But at the same time, we have to be good models of it. I spend a lot of time on my phone. I got to be a good model of how to spend time on my phone. We all need to do that. Every one of the, anybody in here not have a phone? I mean, there might be a couple, of, but most of us have phones. So it's just how we manage that technology. You should get the Calgary app on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug in there. Great transition. That was awesome. You got that on your phone, James? <laughs> I think, too, the truth, truth is important. I think that's the grounding. I think Scripture is truth. But I think the other thing has changed, not changed, the other thing we have to remember is it's not about an easy answer. Um, we talked about being able to, to sit and listen and ask tough questions and not have to spoon feed and not do those kinds of things. I think for so often in the church, we have given them the list of all the answers to these things. And when they don't know how to wrestle with that, they're going to have somebody that's going to ask a question that doesn't fit in the easy answer column. 
So they have, we have to teach people how to think and think biblically and think through a biblical worldview and know scripture, that kind of stuff, but not be able to bang out an answer because that's not going to be the thing that will carry them through. Yeah, I think, Brian, you hit the nail right on the head. What we need to do is not just the, the theology of the word, but the theology of practice and training our students, our kids, and giving them the tools and resources that they need to be able to biblically think through, through this Christian worldview, through, through a lens of the Bible, of the things that are taking place around them, and so often, whether it's in the classroom or even in the homes, in my opinion, there's far too many biblical editors, and we don't need editors, we need practicers. And what's taking place is so often these different voices, their teachers, uh, community leaders, friends, whatever it may be, are the ones who are teaching them their theology. And that's where, again, it's so crucial that as parents, as grandparents, that we're sitting down and we're having those conversations with them because no more would it work. You know, I grew up in the age where when mom, you know, when you ask the question why, she said, because I said so, and that was good enough. But it's not anymore. Um, and so we need to be able to articulate why we believe what we believe. And sometimes it actually begins with a deconstructing of their current worldview, getting them back to, to, to ground zero, and then rebuilding, reconstructing the biblical worldview in their lives. It doesn't happen overnight. Well, and another big thing I see, again, with McKenna, she's in junior high now, so it's really, really cool to just kind of walk this journey with her, but that it's okay to disagree with your friends. Um, you know, if it's, she's under God's rule, and some of them are not under God's rule, right? Or, or not even just um, his, his ways. And they're different than the world's ways. And it doesn't mean that you don't love your friends because you don't agree with their choices. Um, and, and a lot of that kind of goes back on her that, or, or it's, it's shown that, you know, if you disagree, then that means you must hate me, you know, and they see that. And so then their view, like, okay, well, does God love that person if they don't agree with them or whatnot? And so just showing them that they can stand on what they believe and still be full of love, obviously, even more love for that person. So I think something on that lines of trying to get her really confident in what she believes, too, is important. We have a video, right? All right. I mean, if I did all the pictures, it, we would be here for a couple of years, <laughs> and videos, because we all we all definitely loved our kids and loved having memories with them. But we just put a few pictures together so that we wouldn't be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly embarrassing ones of you, Garth. Can I have the unedited version <laughs> with all the pictures? Yes.
You know, I think looking back through all these pictures, it was like so many people helped out and played a role, and it was just amazing. Everyone that came alongside us and helped make it all possible, you know? Yeah. But, but you guys led the way. And the heritage that's up on the platform here is huge. We saw pictures of you guys sleeping in weird positions. And I mean, youth ministry work is, is exhausting. It's hard. Um, it's the weekends are long and the, the retreats are long. And lots of times we, we don't take the opportunity we should to say thank you. So more than anything tonight, as we look at youth ministry today at Calvary, Thank you. <laughs> Not for everything, Tess. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember my truths and lies. <laughs> it was my prayer partners in this room that kept uh, hey, kept man. us alive. It's all good. So thank you for coming tonight. I encourage you to stop, talk to some of these guys if they and gal, if they had an influence in your life, just say thank you to them. And we're just so grateful that you guys made it back. Luke, thanks for taking the time to be here. I know you've got your hands full there, and Brian for you and and Joyce to come down. So. Uh, hey, you know, can I just mention? Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of these people are they're homegrown. Yeah. And we're Thanks. missing one, Robbie. Yeah, Robbie Bryant. He was Robbie up there. just yeah, left. Just left. And he yep. was homegrown. You saw him in the pictures. He yep. came up through the youth ministry. Yeah. Thank you. That's so cool. Thank you, Garth. You're and, homegrown. Um, yeah. And Braden Pape is now a youth pastor. Braden Pape's youth well, pastor. You know, and Matthew Quick is you know. Who knows what he's got waiting for him, and so, yeah. You know, and I was also going to say, we went down the road to introduce the person next to us, but we could go the other way, and how they poured into us in, in major ways, too, and so, um, yeah, you did. <laughs> cool. Well, all right. Should we do that quickly? Yeah, let's do that. Let's go the other way. Good job, Tess. Okay. I don't, I don't want this she night to, to end. She wants to hear from me. I She's do, like, I, do. I just want Dave to say something. Well, we're kind of equals, but I mean, he's way older, so. Cool. Well, um, luckily, uh, Luke was Dave's intern, so if we didn't get along with Dave coming in as the new guy, <laughs> we had Luke there, who was also the cool college student who poured into us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I definitely, I think um, I didn't realize 
I didn't utilize Dave as much as I could have when I was a student and when I was an intern. And so, um, but it was really cool when he comes back from Africa, uh, we can connect with one another and just talk ministry now. And I think, and I have a little more experience and I have better questions. And so um, definitely missed utilizing um, Dave while he was my youth pastor. And then of course, Tess is the one that got me in the got me in the whole game. <laughs> and Garth is the one who, you know, was my first youth group leader. So it's really cool that I had each one of these guys involved in me in some capacity. Yeah, I would not be in ministry today if it were not for Dave. And uh, so Dave came my senior year of high school and I remember at that point graduating and staying local, going to college in St. Cloud there and serving in the youth ministry. And that's really, Dave helped me discern my call to ministry at that time, youth ministry. And um, I just remember the way in which Dave mentored me. It, he truly allowed me into every area of his life. I remember going over to Dave and April's house after youth group. I remember holding Emma as a newborn and being there and uh, being Uncle Lukey and and being able to, to hold her, seeing how they parent, going grocery shopping with them and just having that impact on my life and then uh, being able to serve um, under him, alongside him. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great privilege and joy. So. He just enjoyed the church credit card. That's basically, he's like, you got it? Let's go. So lots of meals on the church credit card with this guy. Buffalo Wild Wings. Yep, we did that a lot. Um, yeah. So that was all discipleship, you know. Chuck, remember I? Yes, yeah, yes. Right. Okay. Right. So um, for Tess, yeah, we, we had our ups and downs. We had our guy-girl mix at different times. Of, this is pink. This is a blue issue. Remember Chuck often having us, you know, this is, yeah. And so we, we had great... <laughs> Great conversations and things. Um, what I appreciate about Tess that she always challenged me with was always being relational. And I know her quote of love God, love people, but also being with the teens. And sometimes it, like I said, it rubbed me the wrong way sometimes because I had a family and it was tough to always be relational and be with the teens. Um, but I could always bank on Tess um, being at their games, taking them out, kind of being that point lead example that when I had a family and I couldn't do it all, um, Tess would be out there saying, I can go to that. I can be at this. And so it was a huge help to work together as a team in that way. And so, yeah, it was just awesome to have that dynamic of what we had. So the pink and the blue worked out. It was good. Well, that was also when I was single. Now that I'm a mom, <laughs> I was apologizing to Rachel McMahon. I wish it would have helped you out more. <laughs> Me too. I did not get it as a single person for so many years either. But... Um, yeah, Garth and Rachel were the best, and um, and even Brian taught me how to water ski. And any ten, like any issue I had, I could go to you, and you could help me with that. And um, I just think, you know, like I would have never gotten out of my shell if you hadn't pushed me, and, and like believed in me. Like you, you, you can do, you can do this. And I was shy. Like even up here, I can blush and start sweating pretty badly sometimes because inwardly I still am quite shy. But you really pulled that out just by being like a goofy person with the teens. <laughs> like, I thought I, I was just something that I could get into as well, too. And just, um, I know um, for, uh, <laughs> um, just, yeah, getting over myself or whatever, you kind of helped me do that, which was really good. And I don't, I know I would not be who I am today without that. And um, I remember my friend John passing away and, um, Garth was the one to tell me about it and then be there for me and then send me on my way. And so um, just, yeah, always being available and um, being able to talk about things. And again, yeah, kind of share. I didn't do life as much with you guys, but sharing your life and just your love for Rachel with me too um, helped, just helped me to be a, a better wife for Brian, you know, as I'm trying to do that. But yeah, both of you guys together too. Um, it was really fun to be your leader. Thank you. Uh, so when when Howard originally asked me to be a youth pastor here, he said we're going to send you to school and we're going to we're going to hire somebody 
who's a little older, a lot older, uh, who is going to be like maybe moving out of youth ministry, who can mentor you and then move into a different position in the church. I'm like, okay, great. That'd be awesome. And then they hire this guy. And he comes along and I said, so are you going to move out of youth ministry? He's like, no. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> and it was the, just the whole situation was kind of, I don't know, it was, it could have been a disaster of any other people's personalities. It could have been like, well, this guy's after my job, I'm after his job. But man, it wasn't. You know, we just got along like, he was like my older brother and just teaching me things. And so, man, I've never seen him mad. Seriously, I could never get him angry. And I tried. <laughs> And uh, Joyce was such a big, integral part of that, too. And uh, Rachel was busy having babies, so she couldn't plug in quite as much. And so Joyce was there, and we were just like this triad. Of, and it was such a great learning experience uh, under Brian. And I, I appreciate you, brother. I really do, yeah. Thanks, Gareth. Um, obviously, there's nobody over here. Um, but there are other youth ministries that went before that laid the groundwork, so I appreciate that. But Garth was here the year before I was. Garth and Rachel were. So in a lot of ways, they were laying groundwork before I came. So, um, so that, that was an awkward situation that we had to walk through that we didn't even, I didn't know that. He didn't know what I had been told. You know, it took a while for us to even, you know, get to that place where we could actually talk openly and honestly about that and just go, you know, okay, well, let's just keep on going. We became good friends and it's just, it was a good, um, a good relationship. The other, the other person I think um, that went before that I appreciate is Perry or Perry and Sandy. Um, they were good friends. We graduated from Moody together. Um, the first couple of years, well, the first year we, Perry and I were roommates with another guy in Chicago where I began a youth ministry there in Chicago. Um, Perry and Sandy, when they were first married, came and were youth leaders in one of our middle school Awana programs. So we did some stuff together, and so that relationship was there. And so it was, it was great to connect here with them and, and be able to have that kind of connection and, and kind of groundwork here. So people go before us, and we connect along the way, and I think that's the strength of community and doing things together. Thanks. Lord, thank you. Thank you for these on the platform and thank you for all those who volunteered with them and all those who came before them. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, for the countless lives that have been touched, students and parents. Think of how many, uh, how many of the students are now raising families of their own and have followed the example that they've seen before them. So we thank you for the faithful service of these. We thank you, Lord, that even some of the questions we ask, that these are people who are still very much involved in trying to find the best way to speak into students' lives. And Lord, as we enter into a changing time here, Lord, as we always do, year after year, things change. But as we continue to navigate these times that you've entrusted to us, may some of the things that we heard tonight help us as we help to navigate and come alongside students every chance we get. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for their faithful service, for their love for you, for their love for students, for their love for each other. And thanks for the legacy that we see before us. We praise you, Lord, and we give you all the glory for that, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming tonight. We're glad you were here. Amen. Yeah.